on behalf of all of us, thank uh, the witnesses and the guests for your indulgence uh, as we voted. And at this point, the Chair would recognize the gentleman from Arizona, Dr. Gozar. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I have just got some, some, uh, some background checks and our questions. Uh, Mr. Sarles, when we are looking at um, uh, doing background checks, do we also do uh, what kind of protocol do we have for monitoring our force um, uh, periodically? You know, I think uh, one of the things we have learned in some of our um, uh, homeland security issues is that we may have had somebody come, by, come through and, and have a different background uh, than they profess to be. Where, what kind of progress do we have for monitoring, particularly like maintenance, all our different types of employees? Basically, when they are hired, we have background checks. Uh, with regard to uh, bus operators, we do checks on driver CDLs uh, to make sure that uh, they are uh, continue to continue to maintain their license. Also, with regard, we have a lot of contractors working on the uh, site, so we have uh, checks on that that we do, uh, I think it's basically every two years, is that right, Chief? Yes. Uh, yeah. Every year, uh, background checks on them. So that's the extent that we do it today. Is that mandatory by compliance from the, the contractor uh, head, um, or is there a random um, review, uh, Chief, you can answer as well? Okay. Many of the um guidelines and, and recommended practices that came by way of either TSA or FTA talks about background checks. And it is something that is not mandatory, but we embrace that and we do it on a yearly basis for all contractors, uh, bus operators, as indicated by Mr. Sauls, or train operators, their driver's license, their criminal records. We want to check that to make sure that they are not uh, uh, have a criminal charge or a traffic violation that prevents them from delivering good quality service. Well, I know that uh, when we reviewed the TSA, we have some concerns about um, some of the folks uh, in delivery, maintenance, that aspect, because we've got a number of access points that mm, don't really, we're more reactive than we're proactive. Um, and, and I want to know more about um, where you would go with that. Um, um, Again, uh, probably the whole universe of our uh, operations, 8,000 employees, we on a probably every two weeks do a records check. So we know if someone is uh, wanted for a particular crime. Uh, as part of their employment, initial employment, they go back and they look at 10 years. But on a consistent basis, we run uh, the checks of our employees, both traffic and criminal, probably about every two to three weeks. Do we review um, how the systems actually work themselves, how people infiltrate um, a system? Um, I guess it's more review. I mean, a as a business owner, there's always, you know, we have an employee, we bring them in, we always have a six-month review. Um, sometimes we'll actually have another review from another employee. You know, those kind of things for monitoring, because it's, you know, just a background check some it is not going to catch everything. Well, from the standpoint of our contractors, we do it on a yearly basis. For our employees, as I indicated, about every three weeks we do a check. Um, sometimes, uh, depending upon the jurisdiction, if they left this area, we don't do a nationwide check. We do the jurisdictional checks, Maryland, Virginia, or the District of Columbia, or if, in fact, they live in Pennsylvania, something like that. In a protocol, if you have a suspicious activity, what would be your normal protocol if you had somebody with suspicious activity or well, again, a, a warning light? Again, we, we, we partner with the FBI Joint Terrorism Task Force, so if there is any suspicious activity that rises to that level that sort of borders on terrorism, we will immediately let them know, again, we have a person the same as uh, Kathy Lanier and Trapwire, that that information is put in there. and so. If there is a possibility that there is a hit or somebody has additional information, we all in law enforcement would know about it. And, and last question, um, how do we involve um, uh, the public? How do we um, go about in improving that relationship? Because the public, I mean, we can't catch everything. Um, we need the public's insight here. And how do we keep them involved and, and constantly uh, take their, their proactive ideas? Good. If you go back, uh, the basis of the See Something, Say Something had its birth in Transit Watch and was similar to Neighborhood Watch, where uh, messages, where things were delivered to transit properties, uh, uh, New York 
took, if you see something, say something. Others adopted, is that your bag, or see it, say it. And so those were slogans that sort of embraced the public into the security and protecting themselves while they're in public transportation. And there are a host of initiatives. I think I was with Chief Lanier when the Secretary Napolitano uh, launching the See Something, Say Something, because it has application not just in transit, but in all types of sectors. So if we see something suspicious, we want to notify the authorities so actions can be taken. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gozar. The Chair at this point would recognize the General Lady from the District of Columbia, Ms. Holmes Norton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank all the witnesses for very helpful testimony. And I especially want to thank you, Chairman Gowdy, uh, for uh, today's uh, hearing on uh, a matter of great importance to the Federal Government because of the importance of WMATA to the Federal Government. Uh, um, I am not sure all of us were here, but in the winter of 2009 and 2010, uh, the Federal Government, it, government it, itself shut down, and the major reason was because WMATA shut down. Um, in, I think it was 2008, Congress uh, did something with respect to WMATA it would never do for any other regional or local system. Uh, it uh, authorized uh, $1.5 billion for capital repairs of, of WMATA. Um, this was done um, when um, my good friends on the other side were in charge. I do want to uh, read what uh, this committee said at the time, uh, at least in part. Metro bus and rail service plays an indispensable role in the day-to-day -day operations of the Federal Government. Uh, and then the committee went on to speak, speak of private citizens who, who have business with the government who depend upon WMATA about the uh, matters of state, um, and concluded, thus, Metro is a national as asset in which all Americans have an interest. Well, the Congress did come to that conclusion, and it's interesting that the, we had difficulty getting the the funds out. We got the first one hundred fifty thousand dollar installment only after nine nine people were killed in the tragic um, metro accident. Uh, as it turns out, about two years ago uh, this week. Um, now. You have indicated that, Mr. Sarles, that if you do not receive the $150,000 this, this year, that would be the third installment, uh, that you would not let safety uh, slip and that you would take everything else away or as much of it as you could in order to, to keep keep the, um, the, 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 the keep Metro safe, and I am sure you would, but I'm not sure the committee understands what you are doing and what we mean by keep it safe. Um, would you be able, for example, to keep on track for the repairs and rehabilitation necessary to make this a safe line? For example, the accident involved cars from the 1970s, which are obsolete, but which you have no alternative but to use. So you are still using, are you not, the 1970s vintage cars uh, the, where virtually all those who died were killed? And what are you going to do? What would be your priorities? Would you be able to be on track even if you pulled all the funds away? Describe to us what the work is all about. Okay. With regard to the $150 million a year, that matched with the local contribution of $150 million is $300 million a year, which is nearly 40 percent of our budget. If we lost that, uh, it would, as I said, cause us to slide backwards. We would still proceed with the purchase of those cars for replacement. That's How many of you? There are 300 uh, cars to be replaced. Uh, those are the oldest cars. Yeah, how many have been purchased so far? We have we we've placed the order for the 300 plus some others. Uh, cars. So no, none of those cars has been replaced as of yet? No. They are being uh, designed right now with the manufacturer Kawasaki in Nebraska. 
Um, and then we start taking delivery, the delivery of them in 2013. But if we lost 40 percent of our capital budget, I said we would still operate safely. That doesn't mean we would operate reliably. Um, for instance, we would not be able to do the track reconstruction. You know, we are dealing with tracks that are rails that are 30, 35 years old. Um, we would not replace them. And what happens when you don't replace them is you have to operate at slower speeds. Uh, so we would slow down the system. Uh, you would also, we would find ourselves doing a lot more daily inspections and finding problems, which would mean there would be interruptions during the, even the peak periods if we have to go in and make a quick fix to keep the railroad running. The same thing is true of buses. Uh, we have been able to, uh, over the last several years, buy enough buses to get the uh, bus system in shape, at least with regard to the age of the buses. Uh, we would have to stop buying those. Uh, as a result, the buses would get older and older and they would break down. And they, the service that we provide to our bus co customers would deteriorate. When you don't do the reconstruction, it means that you have more breakdowns, you operate more slowly because it, in order to keep it safe. And ultimately, uh, we have seen, we have seen tragically what has happened when there wasn't enough funding for this system. Is my time expired? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I thank the general lady from the District of Columbia, Chair, at this point would recognize the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Clay. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and thank the witnesses for their appearance today. Uh, Chief uh, Tabarn, in uh, news, news reports have highlighted an increase in crime at the Prince George's County uh, metro stops. In fact, uh, six of the top ten metro stations with the highest crime rates in the D.C. metropolitan area were in Prince George's County. Can you detail what is being done to curb this, this crime? Sure. Um, in the 86 stations, we have many stations that are end-of-the-line stations, and that is where we have the larger parking facilities, whether it is garages or parking lots. Seventy-five percent of the crimes that occur on the metro are crimes against property, so whether it is still in the GPS, the catalytic converter, or seeing change uh, in the car and breaking the window, still in that, those are the types of crimes that we see most in the outlying jurisdictions, and in particular Prince George's County. What we have done is worked with uh, Interim Chief McGow and reached out to his uh, department, Prince George's County. Uh, the general manager met back in April with 17 of the local jurisdictional law enforcement leaders uh, or their representatives and talked about the crimes in and around the entire jurisdictions and specifically those that we had seen an elevation in crime. And we got a commitment from those chiefs to do as much as they possibly could do. One of the solutions was to provide them with a smart trip card so that their officers on patrol as they go into the parking lots, they could go whenever they are doing a patrol, have access to that, and when you increase the visibility of law enforcement, there is a probability that those people who are violating the crime, committing those crimes will uh, be reduced. We also have, as uh, Chief Lanier indicated, Blue Tide, where we partner on a quarterly basis with law enforcement throughout the National Capital Region and show a combined effort, whether it is in Montgomery County, Prince George's County, the District of Columbia, and we show that we are there to support. And those types of efforts are those that we advocate and uh, jointly participate in collaborations. Thank you for that response. And Chief Lanier, um, I, I want to say it was last year at the uh, L'Enfant Station or one of the Southwest stations, there was a group of uh, young people that were attacking passengers. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, the public saw some of the disturbing video. Uh, has that been curtailed as far as these roving groups of young people that attack passengers indiscriminately? Uh, I can speak to the, the cases that uh, I'm aware of that have occurred kind of uh, entrance into the metros and around the metros. And yes, we've been very successful. Gallery Place was another place where we saw large groups of young people who came down, particularly um, evenings and weekends, um, that were um, creating all kinds of havoc around the train. Um, we worked jointly with Metro to put together 
kind of a crowd metering system uh, experience we learned in some of the larger special events here to kind of separate and meter those groups into the into the transit stations a little bit um, a little bit carefully uh, to keep those groups that are looking to start trouble with other groups separated, and that really has made a big difference, uh, and particularly around the Gallery Place Metro. I know we still have had some disturbing incidents, though. There's a, a lot of uh, young people that come from all over the region that just are um, using the metro as a way to carry out their bad behavior. And and have there been a, a arrest made as far as from from officers uh, witnessing some of this activity? Are you all go looking at video? I'd have to defer to yeah, Chief the, the case that you're making reference to that happened at LaFont Plaza. We did, in fact, arrest the young lady, a female, approximately 15 years of age. Uh, she uh, was found guilty and she was sentenced. And uh, we have other uh, situations that we utilize the videos or any type of information that is provided to us, and we do uh, a concerted effort to investigate all of the sources, and we visited many schools that uh, uh, these young people were attending, and based upon that type of collaboration with the Metropolitan Police Department, we were able to identify this young lady, and she subsequently uh, admitted her uh, involvement in this, and again, she was sentenced. Okay. Um, thank you both for your responses. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman from Missouri. Uh, one of the, uh, the core functions of the Federal Government, obviously, is national security, national defense, one of the core functions of state government, at least in my state, education is in the, is in the Constitution and, and public safety is near and dear to my heart as well and is also a core function of government. And I, I, I feel the pain of, of the budget debates. Um, I can tell you in South Carolina being married to a public school teacher, um, it was tough last year um, watching our, our friends be furloughed. And as a a prosecutor having to furlough uh, your employees in your office for five to seven days without pay and then watch your sheriff uh, have to furlough deputies, uh, it's tough because if you can't spend money on public safety and national security, it makes you wonder where you're spending money. But at some point after the debate is over about our fiscal straits, uh, you all still have to do the job. And uh, so I guess what I'm asking is, aside from the resources which my colleagues have so aptly uh, and ably asked you about, aside from the resources, is there anything else Congress can do? Is there anything else we can do to help you uh, do your jobs better? Um, I understand the budget part and the finance part. Is there anything else we can do? Well, I, 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 everything kind of centers around finance, unfortunately. And, uh, you know, I'll just say from, from my perspective, um, I've been here 21 years in Washington, D.C., so I've been here throughout the uh, Metro's um, development and watching the population in Washington, D.C. and the region continue to grow and watching the shifts in um, economic development and the crime patterns that go along with that. Um, crime patterns um, traditionally follow transportation, whether it be major roadways or trains or, or what it is. Um, we've been really successful driving crime down in the city. Unfortunately, our success is creating issues for Metro because um, when you're really successful at pushing the kind of the hardcore uh, committed uh, folks that are committed to com crime, um, they're going to go the easiest place to, to get their, carry out their crimes and, uh, and get away. And Metro makes it difficult to police. I can't imagine how um, Chief Taborn does his job with the size of the force that he has. I was at um, Pentagon um, last week with a chief over there. Uh, Pentagon Force Protection Uniform Police Department has 850 officers. Um, they are not subject to the volume of 911 calls. They are not subject to the, you know, um, typically the ridership in Metro is almost the population of the District of Columbia. Um, I can't imagine how Chief Taborn polices that Metro. It's geography that moves. Um, it's very difficult. And so I don't know what's always the politically correct thing to say when we're, we're here testifying, but I know that he probably won't say it, but I'll say it for him. I think he needs more police officers. I really, really do. It, you know, we work together and we try and help with that challenge, but um, police officers in those train stations and on those platforms not only make people feel a lot safer, but they will be safer. So that's my two cents. Well, Chief Taborn, Chief Letter, I, you know, 
This is such a different world that, that we're living in, at least uh, those of us up here who grew up uh, in different times. There, one of the beautiful things about the summertime in Washington is the influx of young people either working in my colleagues' offices or working for committees or just visiting the nation's capital. And you stop and think what this current crop of young people has seen from Columbine to Timothy McVeigh to 9-11 to shootings in schools. And it's a world that I didn't grow up in. I grew up with the garden variety stealing and shoplifting and that kind of crime. It's a, it's a different world. My colleagues have addressed the national security part. For the garden variety assaults, and you mentioned uh, property damage, are you getting the prosecutorial support that you want? Are the crimes being taken seriously? And I say that with some trepidation as a former prosecutor, what the answer may be. But are, are, you, are you, is safety that doesn't amount to something uh, cataclysmic and horrible being taken safety and uh, being taken uh, seriously in your judgment. Well, I think in response to your question, uh, those crimes that involve crimes against person persons, we do get a lot of support. Those other crimes that may involve fair evasion, disorderly conducts, uh, spitting, eating, drinking, doing a lot of the smaller things. Our officers make the stop. They write the citations. They go to court. And more often than not, those cases are not prosecuted. And so what that does in operating under constraints with the budget is that we pay overtime when we send an officer to court. Uh, and so when there is no follow-up, and we have not even talked about the juveniles, because juveniles, you either issue them a warning citation or you do a custodial uh, arrest. And, um, they now know that there is not going to necessarily be follow-up if you issue them a citation. And so that is an area that we could seek some improvement. We would also like to improve uh, the grant process to assist us with getting dollars back in the Transit Security Grant Program and to look at the flexibility of those grants. We know that the Department of Homeland Security focuses on terrorism, but many of the crimes that happen in the subway uh, we may not be able to get funding to uh, attack that, but if we attack the regular day-to-day -day crime, the spinoff is that is going to make it diff difficult for a terrorist to commit any other crime. So uh, the funding of an explosive canine is an example. That will be funded, but a regular patrol dog will not be funded. And so we often ask, and we will be asking uh, TSA next week when we meet with the top 50 transit chiefs in Denver to see if, in fact, there is some flexibility in the grant so that we cover the whole universe of security. Thank you, Chief. Uh, to my colleagues, given the seriousness of the issue and the fact that our witnesses were gracious enough to wait on us, if, if anyone is interested in a, I guess we will call it a, a lightning round, if anyone wants to ask a couple of follow-up questions, uh, uh, the, gentleman, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank you for your indulgence. I just got uh, one question I'd like to do a little follow-up on the whole question of background checks. And I'd like to ask a hypothetical question, uh, basically because I am concerned that we don't deny individuals the opportunity to reenter the workforce or to regain acceptance back into society after they have uh, been convicted of criminal violations. If a person, say, if, if a person had gotten caught with enough marijuana 13 years ago to be arrested and convicted, come back under the 10-year rule depending on what the transgression may have been, would that person be eligible for employment uh, with the agency? I would really have to get back to you with that, the specific answer on that. Uh, we tried to balance uh, what the crimes were against what the person is being asked to do. So I would have to get back to you with a more specific answer on that. Thank you very much. I would appreciate that, because I have run into so many instances where there was blanket denial. And then when you do a little checking, you find out that the individual may have 
done something uh, that he or she would actually pose no threat at all to anything, but their record is there and they're denied an opportunity. So I would very much appreciate uh, an answer to that question. Thank you very much. Ms. Holmes Norton, Mr. Clay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, just one question. I would be remiss if I didn't ask it. After all, this is a, a committee consisting of members from throughout the country. Um, and my question really has to do with the effect of the Red Line Metro crash uh, on other parts of the country. Most of us did not know, I do not believe I knew until the crash, that there were no national rail standards. Uh, I was astonished because I am accustomed to safety standards in every other mode of transportation. No one would think of getting on, a, on an airplane uh, if they thought that there weren't, that every uh, every city could do its own <laughs> standards. This is the very essence of of interstate commerce. Now, obviously, these trains don't always go across state lines the way the way ours do, but um, the Congress, in the wake of uh, this uh, historic um, crash that so alarmed the country, um, many many of us introduced a bill. And it is reintroduced this year that would require the Department of Transportation to develop uh, national rail standards. Now, local jurisdictions could have their own standards if those standards were consistent with national standards. They would not have to be enforced uh, by the Department of Transportation, or they could ask the Department of Transportation to take on that task. Uh, I ask this question, Mr. Sauls, because we are fortunate that you have led two. Uh, major transit uh, systems. Uh, I'd like to know whether you think national rail standards uh, would have would help improve the um, safety of metro and other uh, rail transit uh, agencies or uh, around the, the the country. And if so, how and why? Um, in fact, in my last position, we uh, ran commuter rail, which is is governed by federal regulation, the FRA. Uh, I welcome that. Um, I, I think it is good to have uh, national standards. It helps in uh, So computer rail here in the district? Computer rail here would have FRA regulations. So the, they would be governed by national standards. Right. Uh, you are from, is it New Jersey? From New Jersey, right. Uh, New Jersey so trend. part of what you, <laughs> part of what you had jurisdiction over were governed by national standards. Right. How did you do the rest? Well, we had a, a state oversight uh, committee. Uh, Commission or committee, uh, which um, oversaw the light rail lines, uh, we worked well with them. I will say that, as the, an operator, the primary responsibility is for safety. The primary responsibility for safety rests with us. But it's excellent to have oversight because you never see everything. Nor well, you have some oversight. You know, each, yes, uh, you don't have the same standards though. So you can That's have apparently a very low standard. Uh, in one part of the country and a high standard in the other. Is that? And that is why I think the, the Federal Government involvement in terms of making sure that even if the State agencies are doing it as an oversight, that there is some over, overlaying uh, uniform set of uh, criteria so that everyone uh, lives up to the same standards, I think, is a good idea. Uh, good, 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 good. I have just a few more minutes, I think. Could, could I ask, uh, I was astonished that bus drivers, uh, I, get, I, get, I guess I should ask you, uh, Chief, I was astonished that bus drivers were being uh, attacked apparently um, uh, often enough so that, the, that a job action was, was threatened and that the attacks may be over, over fares. Could you explain what, what prompts these attacks and what attacks and what you are doing to protect our bus drivers? Sure. So far this year, there have been approximately 22 to 25 assaults on bus operators, and they span from either spitting upon a bus operator 
throwing a cup of water upon a bus operator, assaults with a weapon. Uh, the case that we had last week out at Capitol Heights was a mother who had a stroller and wanted to bring the stroller on. It is the policy of WMATA that you fold your stroller up for safety reasons. She did not want to do that. She decided to spit in the face of the bus operator and subsequently punched her. And so that was a situation that happens. Most of the uh, assaults stem from uh, fair, fair cases. Uh, people who don't want to pay the fare, and one would conclude that the bus operator probably has the most difficult job in transportation. They have to ask for a fare, deal with uh, people who uh, may not care for them, and then drive the bus while they are sitting behind them. And so oftentimes they may be the subjects of assaults. Uh, so we have been working with the, the various unions to come up with uh, ways that we can. Are there more officers on, on the buses? Uh, the, the chief, our chief spoke about how you need more officers, but when you see something like that happen, how does a bus driver know that he can go out and that he's going to be, he's going to get home in the next, uh, in the evening? One of the other things we are looking at is how to protect the bus driver. You can't have a police officer on every bus. No. So we have been working with uh, the union to come up with a shield that would separate the uh, bus driver from the, uh, the passengers. It is one way to pro provide protection to them. I regret that that has to be done, but you can't ask people to drive a bus if, if you are going to be assaulted and you don't know who is going to get on the bus to do so. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the general lady from the District of Columbia, and I want to thank the witnesses. Uh, Chairman, for with your indulgence, could I? I thought Mr. Clay had a question. Oh, I did. oh, I'm sorry. The gentleman from Missouri. I apologize. Just real quickly, I won't take the entire five minutes. Uh, uh, Chief Taborn or uh, Mr. Griffin, in fiscal year 2011, Congress appropriated $2.2 billion for f uh, FEMA state and local program which include the Transit Security Grant Program and the Urban Area Security Initiative. Uh, for, for fiscal year 2012, President Obama requested $3.8 billion for the state and local programs. Earlier this month, the House passed the fiscal 2012 Department of Homeland Security Appropriations Bill, which provides $1 billion for state and local programs, or $2.8 billion below the President's request and $1.2 billion below fiscal year 2011. Uh, Chief Tabor, how would substantial cuts to the Transit Security Grant Program affect Metro's ability to prevent a terrorist attack? Any cuts in uh, grants would have an impact, but we cannot just think about this transit agencies, there is about 6,000 transit agencies across the country, many who are larger or who are in metropolitan areas, and we can selfishly want to make sure that we get all of the funds. And so the decision as to how they go about uh, assigning the grants based upon the risk and the assessments is a difficult one, but many of the programs that we want to move forward that uh, are based upon assessments that have been conducted on our system would sort of fall by the wayside. So, you know, we would encourage the funding of those programs to the, to the highest level. Thank you. And, Mr. Griffin, uh, how would substantial cuts to the Urban Area Security Initiative affect the national capital region's ability to prevent a terrorist attack, including against Metro? It certainly would make it a greater challenge. Um, given my experience over the years, I have cautioned the decision makers um, on two issues. Uh, one, I think it is advisable to use the grants uh, to the extent possible on one-time acquisition, more capital-oriented, uh, so that if the grant goes away, you still have the capital and you are not building in operational requirements. Uh, the second guideline that I have advocated is that we should not initiate any program with the UASI funding that we are not willing as local governments to sustain. Um, and that has been a tough message um, and not one that has always been adhered to. Uh, but the reality of it is for the process that we have just completed, there was an 18 percent reduction in UASI funding. 
uh, and that was handled primarily um, by Homeland Security by eliminating funding for the second tier UASI eligible communities so that the first tier communities could continue to receive the funding they had received the previous year. Uh, I would forecast that, that that funding is going to continue to decline, and I, we have to embrace our decision making that leads to continuing programs that we can sustain at the local level uh, once the funding disappears. And we are in the, in the Washington metropolitan area, second tier or first? Uh, we're first tier. Uh, we rank uh, fourth in terms of the amount of funds received behind New York City first, Los Angeles second, Chicago third, okay. um, D.C. fourth. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I thank the gentleman from Missouri, uh, the gentleman from uh, Illinois. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, this is certainly my last question. Uh, Mr. Griffin, the Transit First Coalition has called on Vermont Board of Directors and member jurisdictions to look at alternatives to cut in services, knowing that something has to occur. Are there any other options that, that, that you might be thinking of that would uh, provide the opportunity to not cut services but, but continue to provide those that are obviously greatly needed? I can only speak from the perspective of Fairfax County. In uh, Virginia, a substantial amount of the operational funding, uh, the operational subsidy that is provided to WMATA is actually provided by the local jurisdictions. Um, and so it is a significant consideration when I prepare a budget for my Board of Supervisors. Uh, we have over the years continued to support WMATA and have paid the county's share for both operational and for capital. Uh, and we see that as a very valuable investment. Uh, we do have to balance that against all the other um, activities that we have within the county. Uh, I, I'm not advocating that we give more. Uh, necessarily, uh, what, what we do is we take a look, we take a balanced look at what our requirements are um, and, and what is desirable in the way of service provided by uh, WMATA. And that is not just the rail, it is also the bus service. Um, we look at uh, doing things collaboratively. Um, Fairfax County recently built a new uh, bus maintenance facility in the western part of the county, and we collaborated with WMATA. It is actually a shared facility. Uh, it meets WMATA's requirements and it clearly meets our own requirements. We run a very large bus system as well. Um, so we look for collaborative ways to, to do business together uh, to enhance the service but minimize the cost. Thank the gentleman from Illinois. Uh, the gentleman from Arizona, Dr. Gozar. You know, my colleagues bring up a good, a good point. You know, as a business owner, you know, there is only a limited amount of, of money here. And so I want to ask the question, um, I think one of the major concerns from the GAO and the congressional uh, fellows in regards to budget is we got a problem and, and we want to know why the problem of not uh, where we have 80 percent of the funding not being used. Tell me, tell me uh, can you provide us why we have funding that in the estimates of almost 80 percent of the Federal grant dollars have, that you have received have not been used? Can we get a detail on that? Which grant program are we referring to? Uh, the unused security grants. Unused security grants. Well, I think there, and I will let the Chief go into the details, one of the issues is in that, in that particular case, I think we have obligated almost 100 percent uh, of the, uh, the grants. But when you look at the process, unlike the FTA, when you look at the process that is used by the agencies that provide that funding, it is a different process. It is a very lengthy process to get, uh, to, get to the money. And I will let the Chief go through uh, the details on it. I think, as Mr. Sarles indicated, many of the grants that we have received through the Transit Security Grant Programs came to us 
oftentimes 16 and a half months into a 30-month program. And so they also come with requirements that we have to do environmental um, uh, pre uh, his historic preservations. So there are a lot of different requirements, and oftentimes when we make applications for those grants, using the design and technology that we applied for, that technology may have changed. And so anytime that there is a change, we have to go back through the cycle, uh, reach back out to FEMA, and submit again. And so it is not something that is unique to this transit agency. I think you find the same thing with transit agencies across the country. Internally, we are working to do everything that we can in the most expedient manner to, to comply with FEMA, to comply with the Department of Homeland Security. But there, too, there is a, a discussion of policy, which policies to use and which guidelines to go through. And oftentimes, transit agencies are waiting to find out what it is that they need to do, because we would definitely like to expend that money. We have identified those projects. and. Uh, all of that money, as indicated by Mr. Sauls, have been obligated, but we have to adhere to the requirements of uh, FEMA or, in some of the grants, the State uh, Administrative uh, Office. So in, 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 in context, a lot of the problems have to do with who has got the jurisdictional aspects and, and the lack of a nimble Federal Government and agency review. Am I, am I speaking? Clearly? You are absolutely correct. Because I know I am one of those people that actually had to sponsor a jurisdictional problem over two agencies over who had jurisdiction of a pipeline and who had the ground. Right. It's, it's, it's become um, um, obscene um, as a taxpayer, as a businessman, and as a citizen. Um, so, I, Mr. Sarles, I guess my point comes back to you again, is, is that one size doesn't fit all. I heard a comment about you know, having one set of standards. Um, one size does not fit all at all, does it? I am not exactly sure uh, what you mean by that, but I want to give you a contrast in terms okay. of Federal rules and, uh, and grant making. On the error grants, which is I think we got $100 million, might have, maybe it was $200 million, we have expended two-thirds of that because the rules are different, the process for getting the money was different, and we were able to put it to, to work faster. And we see the same thing when you look at uh, formula funding grants from the FTA. Uh, the rules are different. We are able to get uh, through the process faster and be able to expend and get improvements from it. So to me, it seems like that we should be evaluating agencies based upon like a nonprofit, should we not? Because, you know, for example, uh, an agency like the Army Corps of Engineers where you have a $3 million grant and you, only $1 million of it actually goes to the services. Um, the administrative cost within that, two-thirds, is ridiculous. And so what we have to have is, is a, an agency that is much more nimble and working with local um, and state facilities to make sure that more of that dollar is actually spent and allowed you, the, nimb the nimbleness, to, to utilize it the way you see fit based on the conditions here. Because the dish conditions here are going to be a lot different than they are for me in Arizona, are they not? I don't know about Arizona, but I know here that uh, when we get the money, we uh, expend as fast as possible to get the improvements to our customers. Thank you. I want to thank our, our panel. Uh, Ms. Holmes Norton was gracious enough to take me to meet Chief Lanier, and then Chief Lanier was gracious enough to introduce me to her department, which uh, remains uh, that visit remains one of the highlights of my first five months. So, Chief Tabor, and I would. I would love if I don't know whether Ms. Holmes Norton would be willing to take me anywhere else or not. Uh, I think she probably will. She's very gracious. <laughs> Anytime, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> uh, I, I would love if uh, if she would uh, uh, allow me to join her to to visit uh, to visit you, so I can know more about it and be a, a better advocate for for you and your officers. Absolutely, so. we would be honored. Well, uh, thank you, and uh, again, thank the, the guests for uh, indulging us while we voted, and uh, we will be adjourned.